Okay. Yeah. Hello, I am Michael Ruggiero, and I am the Director of Exchange Engineering at Shared Fruit. And today I'm going to talk about one-on-ones. The name of my talk is, you keep using that word, uh, what do one-on-ones really mean? Um, so this is just the slide about me, which is I've been at Shared Fruit for over four years. I work at these other companies. You see their logos below. Um, I manage Teams Live Nation, and uh, I've done a lot of work on what makes one-on-ones really your most powerful tool, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, and it's really for understanding your team and inspiring your team. So uh, oh, that's me. So next is the meme itself. I think if you know the meme, it's from the 1987 film The Princess Bride. And in that movie, one character keeps using the word inconceivable, when actually that just means they just mean unexpected. And if you're doing one-on-ones now probably wondering, how could I be doing it wrong? It's kind of inconceivable itself because you're doing it. So what could we be doing better or improving upon? Um, so this is the definition, you know, a regular face-to-face -face meeting. You're identifying areas where the report is doing well or could make improvements, and you're helping them on a career path. And if you're doing them, continue to do them. That's a good thing to do. Don't stop just because I said you could do it better. Um, but I think what happens is that you fall into habits. And the real one-on-one -on -one tends to get a little bit lost in those habits. So HR complaints, <laughs> checking on how the project is going, how are you doing? Um, all of those are things that you could find out in the hallway, or using Slack, <laughs> or just because you communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. But not really. it's not really what the one-on-one -on -one is about. Um, and honestly, my one-on-ones were like that for a very long time, so I think we're all at that place at a certain point in our career. Um, but I would suggest that there are some ways that you can break this down into something that's a little deeper and gets more curious about the type of people you're working with. Um, so one is, what questions are you actually asking? Because just asking how you're doing or what's going on um, is just not deep enough for you as the person who's going to be the the mentor or the person helping someone grow. Second thing is, are you really even hearing what they're telling you? It's obviously very important, and it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, and the third thing is, what actions are being taken as a result of the conversation that you're having? Because ultimately, every meeting that you're in, you, know, you should have action items that follow up at the end of the meeting and things that we're going to do as a result of the meeting. We just don't want to have meetings for the same kind of meetings. So, I want to remind you that we fall into habits, and you match on patterns, and you have a whole set of stories that go along with the people that you work with uh, every day. And you think you're getting it all, but there's some stuff beneath those patterns that you may not be doing. So as an example, Alice is happy. When she comes into my office for the one-on-one, -on -one, she has energy and a good outlook. I already knew that. You already knew that. Um, Bob complains. That's how he processes the world, by complaining. And you knew that before Bob came in, and so if you just talk about his complaints for the whole time, you're not really getting anywhere deeper with Bob. And Ted is obsessed with that technology that he talks about all the time. Again, this is a pattern that you've established, and you're not really going to get much more from that conversation. Your stories, the ones you already have when people come into your room, they're only going to go so far. So I have three kind of strategies for getting more curious with the people that are working with you. So one is to have a list of questions prepared. Have a whole list of questions that you want to know about the people who you're working with. And draw on those questions. And they should span lots of different kinds of categories. The second thing is to actually hear what they're saying. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And the third thing is to have action items from every one-on-one. -on -one. Every one-on-one -on -one should have something that you're going to do and something your report is going to do and you're going to bring back the next time you meet. So this is my list, and I'll share the link to this on the RAND Slack, and uh, it'll be at the end of the talk as well. It's about 100. I change them now and again. There's a whole bunch of categories. Um, some of them are really squishy and emotional. Some of them are much more like what's exciting to you technologically right now. Um, but I ask everybody the same four questions. Everyone in my reports gets the same four questions. 
Um, I stole this from Jason Vanish, who wrote this great blog post on 101 questions to ask on 101s. He also talks about doing action items as well, and that's just a good thing to read. Um, here are some examples of my questions, and it might seem weird to ask the same four questions to every person. Um, you know, your people are different, and they will respond differently to different things. But you can uncover patterns that you have built unconsciously. So a lot of times, I have one report, and I will ask him questions, and every answer he gives me is completely unexpected. I never know what he's going to say, even though I think that I do. Um, but we, again, I'm not going to ask the how could work be easier questions to the complainer. I'm not going to ask uh, what should we do for team morale to the happy person. I want to get lots of information about these people, and so I try to have the same set of questions for each person coming into the room. Um, and again, there's multiple categories. Um, some of them are about career growth, growth, some of them are about just what do they want to do for the weekend. I want to know who they are. And you want to find out what bugs them. And it might be you that bugs you. <laughs> if somebody tells you that you're an irritating boss, I want you to know that's a huge gift they are giving you. Because that means that they are actually willing to be vulnerable enough with their boss to tell their boss that they are annoying. That's a huge amount of trust that you have built with your person. So if someone says that to you, I, I, I want to congratulate you. Um, it's never happened to me, of course. Um, so this structure seems a little abstract. It seems like kind of a rigid system. And I, I think that I don't want to miss the point about coaching. Uh, I don't see a lot of motivation in here or vision in here. Um, coaching is really important to me as a person. Uh, two of my coaches are here. Marcy's right here, and Slip is somewhere here. Um, they are amazing coaches, and I'm fortunate to have them. Um, so coaching is really important to me. Um, and of course, the greatest coach of all is Coach Taylor from <laughs> Televisions and Friday Night Lights. Now, even if you haven't seen the, show, the program, Coach Taylor is a very inspiring coach. He's super handsome. And uh, he's firm but fair and good of his family. Um, but I would argue that what makes Coach Taylor's speeches inspiring um, is the fact that he shows up for practice every day. And Rand's talked about this in his talks about the consistency of that check-in. Um, making that a really consistent time that you show up to all the time. Because your report is really landing at that time. The person who's working for you, that's their time to tell you what's going on. So being that consistent check-in is super important for the one-on-one -on -one and, and really shouldn't be un underestimated. Um, because you get busy and things happen and it's hard to be predictable sometimes. You're doing a lot of stuff and you're going from meeting to meeting. But being trustworthy literally means being worthy of trust. So being predictable is an advantage in so, yeah, a huge part of making that vision stick, and a huge part of making that speech really effective before they go on the gridiron is people knowing exactly who you are and what you believe. So, um, and part of that is just listening, really, really listening. And I like to talk. I am a talker. And so it's important for me to even set a clock uh, in the one-on-one -on -one to make sure that I shut my mouth after 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So I actually literally do that. And sometimes people will respond to your questions and they'll shrug. I go, I don't know. Sure. I don't really have an opinion about that question. That's when you have to say, well, what do you think when I ask you that question? Or what is your opinion of that question? Uh, what, do you, what feelings do you have when I ask you that question? You have to continually come back to people and find out what's going on with them and where they're coming from. You can even make an AR out of it and say, well, I think that you might have some feelings about that question, so your assignment is to come back next week with three sentences on that question. So, Get to be a dad in some ways, and that's fun. Um, but the point is you're going deeper here than just how's it going and what are you up to. Um, so here's a story of doing it wrong. This actually happened um, to me. Alice wanted to go to a trade show. And uh, you know, going to the trade show involves people who are willing to talk about the product, sell the product, and talk to potential clients and sign them up. And Alice was good, but her interest in the product was pretty not much there, and I just didn't see her really being a representative of the product. She just wasn't that enthused about it. But she really wanted to go. And she said, well, can you ask your boss to have me go? And it was his decision at that time. And I said, 
I'll ask him. And I asked him, and he said, well, what do you think? Should she go? And I went, uh, and he said, well, she can go next year. So she said to me, hey, how did it go? Did, did I get the, am I going to go to the trade show? And I said, well, no, no, you go next year. She said, well, did you tell your boss that I really, you know, want, well, I was going to be really good? I went, well. <laughs> she saw that as a pretty big betrayal. And she was right. She took the time to be vulnerable with me about something that was super important to her. And I didn't advocate for her. I didn't let her know what I actually thought of her request. And her, our trust was ruptured at that point. And you know, what might have helped is if I had been transparent with her and said, you know, it would be great if you were to the trade show, but here's what go to the trade show involves. You need to be like an eight in terms of like presenting the product to a potential customer. And I don't see you at that place yet, so let's talk about what we can do to bring you to a place where you would feel really comfortable doing that and I'd feel really comfortable sending it. That would have been really helpful for her. So again, what she told me was, I want to go to a trade show. What I heard was, oh, yeah, trade shows are fun. That wasn't what she was saying at all. She was saying, this, would, this is something I want to do because it reflects my interest in the business and I want to learn more about the business. I thought it was a perk. And she wanted it as an opportunity to grow. So I wasn't really hearing what it is she was actually saying. Um, that takes vulnerability. And this is my book recommendation. It's the one I'll make in this talk. Um, it really spoke to me about vulnerability and sitting with a couple of things. It's called Rising Strong by Brene Brown. And she has this thing in there about the delta. And the delta, um, not just the, the symbol for the, uh, the change in any changeable quantity, but really the space between the stories that you have and the truth that's out there that you haven't learned yet. So, you know, river deltas form when the river carrying sediment hits the body of water, like an ocean or a lake. And uh, it's hard to navigate, it's full of mud, it's, uh, it's messy. But that's where all the plant life comes from. That's the richest place for plant life. And when Alice says, I want to go to the trade show, there's a space that I need to explore between what I thought about trade shows and what she was actually saying to me about trade shows. So the same thing with Ted and his technology. Oh, I'm really interested in this technology. It's really great. That reflects a deeper value that he has that I need to understand. And for me to just pattern match on that's the technology that Ted's interested in is not going deep enough to, to understand what he's really talking about. Um, and this sounds hard. It is hard. Um, but it's an honor. Like this is, this is your work. This is what you're going to do. And you're getting, you want to be worthy of trust. People need to be vulnerable with you. You need to be vulnerable with them. So we all know what it's like to have like a set of commits at the end of the day. Like that endorphin hit you get when you look at the set of commits that you did. And you're like, yes, I did this. I built this thing. Um, you don't get that as much as a manager. You can get it some once in a while, but um, you know how hard this is for your personal projects. You know, like I'm going to learn this framework in two weeks, and you do this personal project, and the first thing is four commits, and then it's three commits, and then it's two commits, and then it's the weekend, and you stop. What makes that a more powerful exercise for people who, like, are in a work situation? Like, you get a lot of commits during the day because there's sustained activity. Sustained activity. You're doing it inside this container of continuing to ship, needing to ship. Um, you're doing the same thing with your people. You're building this sustained activity with them. So here's an example of where it worked. So Bob wanted to be a public speaker. And he was nervous. He didn't think he had anything to say. And we talked about what it would take. Like, let's look at the CFPs. Let's identify three talk ideas that you have and see which one you like best and why. Um, write a proposal and give it to me, and I'll tell you what I think of it. Like, I'll give you feedback. Um, let's pick three conferences you really want to speak at, and let's put together a proposal. Action items over and over again, building sustained activity. It's like commits. Like, he's coming back to you and saying, I did this thing. Oh, that's good. Let's do another thing and build on that and build on that. Not just a promise of, yeah, it would be great. I'll help you with that sometime. It's really that check-in again. It's the coach always showing up for practice. And he did all the work. I didn't do the work. He did it. But you know, just last, this, this last year, he went to a DevOps conference and gave a great talk. And it was amazing. And he's going to do another talk. 
And it's just awesome to see that. So this all comes back to why do we even do one-on-one? Because there's no constitutional anything that says you have to do this. You don't have to do one of those. You could just say hi to people in the hallways and help them with their HR problems, and that would be it. But there's a reason why we do them. And one of them is that you have people who want to go someplace and do something. And are you helping them do that thing? The other is, again, a trustworthiness. Like, you need to build a rapport with somebody. And if you just have this kind of superficial relationship that only goes so far, then you're only going to help them that much because you're not going to know what they want to do. Um, so this should be work for you. Um, but again, celebrate that you've been given the opportunity to work with these people because these are obviously very smart people and you're lucky to get this opportunity. So again, list of questions, same list of questions for each person, actually hear what they're telling you, and then action items at the end of each one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much.